The Telberg Foundation is deeply committed to the idea that the 21st century needs leaders who are courageous, innovative, global in perspective, and infused with universal values. That's why we created the Telberg SNF Eliasson Global Leadership Prize. It's also why this year we established an emerging leader category, searching for leaders who have already had impact, but whose leadership is still growing and evolving. Our jury selected two emerging leaders, Pashtana Dirani, an Afghan educator and activist working to create digital learning opportunities, especially for girls, in her war-torn country, and Christian Nitsamira, a Rwandan medical doctor who has introduced and who champions palliative care in Rwanda and elsewhere in Central Africa. In this edition of New Thinking for New World, two 2021 jurors will discuss with the winners of our Emerging Leader Prizes their views on the challenges of global leadership today. We will start with Shahadul Alam, a Bangladeshi photographer and human rights activist, in conversation with Pashtana. Salam. Salam, salam. Uh, wonderful to see you here. The emerging category is new to us. We weren't really sure how it would turn out. You are the proof of how important it is. But I'm intrigued. You know, repressive governments are the norm rather than the exception today. Here in Bangladesh, there is an environment of fear. While there are protests by students right now, the protests are difficult and dangerous to organize. Yeah. Floored by the fact that women are in the streets of Kabul at a time like this. And we see people like you. Where does this courage come from? I think uh, in Pashto, we say that uh, if you want to, like, you know, groom camels, you have to make, uh, like, you know, doors that are, like, you know, higher. So I think we know that the troubles that come, you have to have that big heart to fight it. I guess that's the whole thing. Well, you received the Malala Fund. Malala Fund. Uh, she too questioned the Taliban and went on to question marriage, both of which she <laughs> got into trouble for in various ways. But she has been remarkably silent uh, on the complicity of the West in creating many of these problems. You, on the other hand, have no such inhibitions. Yeah. You remind us that there is no morality in international politics, that there is only self-interest. You tell the international community to stop creating migrants if they want to stop migration. Yeah. We're very clear when you say the world did this to us. What effect do you think this award, provided by a segment of the globe you critique, will have on you? I think when I was very young, I have always been this headstrong. So I always make sure that people around me do know what I think, even if they don't ask for it. So when I was very young, my mom used to tell me, you know, you need to learn some diplomacy because uh, you cannot just uh, criticize people. You cannot just point fingers. And... Um, up until this award, I, to myself, I used to think sometimes that even if I scream at the whole world, nobody's going to listen or respect it. Because at the end of the day, everyone has an interest uh, in poor people of Afghanistan, in starving children of Afghanistan, in women at home in Afghanistan. All of this serves an interest, be it the Taliban, be it um, the government of Afghanistan, or be it the Western uh, donors who were very much involved in this crisis. Uh, and then I got this award and it was all because they listen to me and then I thought to myself hmm there are like my people and they do listen and they are not inhibited by the what the propaganda is all around the world that it's like you know black and white there are always people who are always going to be anti but there are always going to be organizations like this one and they're going to respect your work so I think for me this this helps me this motiv motivates me to be on the that I am on the right track you talk, you're a very pragmatic person and very oh, yeah. clear priorities. You talk of policing. You point out the weakness of the logic of the Taliban as well. Uh, you talk about women being sexualized. You talk about curricula, about rewriting history. What can you do at a practical level to prevent this happening? This is one thing I am always concerned about. So when activists talk, 
that's very different but when activists work the whole community stands with them and i have seen it it's um, god's beautiful work every time an activist starts working on a grassroots level everyone knows that they are not coming up with some uh, western or eastern or the taliban's uh, ideology in their mind they are just making sure that their community survives through it and for me that was much more important for me pragmatism is when i talk about girls education i do open schools every now and then and make sure that 100 leaders are educated so that in the next 10 years when i'm old enough when i can't talk the loud that i can right now there are 100 more girls who can talk on the same level and who scream even louder so for me pragmatism but also practicality is important i make sure that every course has a feminist uh, um, side to it so that when girls open books they see themselves they see women of color they see women from their own community and they look up to them not just some men from the west who did amazing things um you just referred to feminism uh people tend to think that feminism was something discovered in the west but oh yeah <laughs> uh over 100 years ago wrote sultana's dream a feminist science fiction uh novel that took people to a land which was run by women where the men stayed inside and uh, that was a dream she had what would a dream afghanistan be for you for me a dream would be that girls education is not po- politicized the way it is that women uh, get to go to work and at the end of the day men of afghanistan do realize that fighting for someone else's agenda within your own country doesn't serve you doesn't serve your country that is my dream i hope the men realize in my country that they are fighting for someone else's war they are not fighting for their own war or their country oh well, that leads on to a statement from your video where you say that's not how it works oh yeah for you it's- you continue to be an optimist despite all of that how does it work at the end of the day you have to realize that there will always be challenges i have ch- faced challenges in the past where i was in ministerial uh, meetings and i was asked uh, to leave because i told them that this solution works better and i still strived and i still had the community that supported me and they stood with me and they opened the schools with me while the donors who actually went to the same place a million times to, to launch the same school we opened actually new schools and kept them running so that's how it works you believe in your own community you believe in your own people you make sure you give them the right to educate you make sure that you facilitate it you don't give it to them you facilitate it and you make sure that when you know there are better resources out there you make sure that those are available to your people because they need it the most and you are the educated one in them uh, i'd like to go to a more personal level uh, surely doing what you do in the community that you're in is not easy at many levels but what are the personal struggles you've had what are the responses you've had that have surprised you uh, what have been your disappointments um it's uh... I I think I always struggle with the, the the governments because somehow I don't know I don't fit their agendas at all for me it's more on like you know you don't need a lot of money to do the work you just need the right kind of the money and for them it's always like you know take one picture of a child starving to death and then sell it to the whole world take the money and then never serve the community for that so that's one of the huge disappointments that I have faced over the course of years every time I talk I people go and target my family people go target my community people go target my father or mother even yesterday I was targeted for my mom and her uh, her roots um that's a disappointment but at the same time on community levels there were times when i met um, old men and i asked them to send their daughters to school and uh, he was like why should i send them to school what good would they bring this is a, a place where we don't have electricity what can they do and i was sh- to myself yeah why should he send his daughter to school and this was disappointing because i didn't have answer and i was disappointed in myself i went back i did some research and i came back to him i was like you know when god sent uh, in quran he said that muslims should pray right men and women he didn't say that only men should pray so when god asks you to pray then why can't you just uh, when god doesn't discriminate when it comes to praying why are you discriminating when it comes to education and he did let girls go to school after that so for me that was a big disappointment when i didn't have the answer right away because i always have answers uh, 
Well, you got there in the end. Yes. But that is something else. I mean, uh, you, of course, give importance to, you mentioned very clearly what are the things that students should, should learn and that there should be women teachers of a particular level and things like that. But uh, a lot of that seemed to uh, talk about what are considered to be Western modes of learning and education. Is there a different pedagogic model? Is there a different mode of teaching that you think is needed for Afghanistan? One thing about Afghanistan people tend to forget is Afghanistan used to be the center of arts and uh, culture within the Central Asia. If you see when it comes to feminism, people always talk about suffragettes movement, but they forget that Gavhar Shad Begum thousands of years ago, she built the minarets of Herat and she was the, actually the first woman who made sure that there are universities. So the whole Central Asia and MENA region can come and study there. And this is thousands of years ago. 100, 100 years ago, we had a women minister of education while the West didn't even have the voting rights for women. So you have to understand that there is this difference. But also when it comes to education, every Afghan house in Afghanistan has books. It starts with books. We always have books. In the West, I have seen when children start going to schools, the parents buy books for them. I am visiting these families and when the kids are in school, they're buying stuff. But before that, they have toys. I remember every house that I have been to in Afghanistan, we have a window and within that window, we have uh, sets and sets of books and that is practiced. After a dinner, the whole house sits together and uh, listens to the radio show, but also practices poetry, also po practices the history, also practices the geography of Afghanistan. And that is education in itself. So we start educating ourselves when we are very young with the old tales in our families. And then that continues to the modern world that I feel like, you know, technology can serve us well and that we should be focusing on digital literacy where we don't have electricity or internet. We definitely have prob uh, uh, solutions like offline uh, apps and at the same time, solar panels that solves a lot of problems when it comes to education. The Prophet's mosque uh, was very different from the type of mosques uh, yeah. we encounter. It was a community center, it was a health center, it, it was a learning place, it sheltered women. Uh, it was even an art space. I, I know of the Abyssinian artists who performed in the mosque. Uh, how do you see the mosque in Afghanistan playing a different role? Uh, and would they have a role in education? I think one thing you have to, we need to know about is when uh, the whole world says, oh, these people are fighting for religion. They are not. They are actually oppressing religion because freedom of religion comes when the prophet in prophet's mosque. The women used to go to that mosque. They used to access the learning, the uh, uh, religion, the praying, the educational opportunities. And in our mosques in Afghanistan, women are not allowed to go. In my mosque, I was not never allowed to go. Uh, when I started menstruating, I was never allowed to go back. So there is a dis gender discrimination even when it comes to religion in Afghanistan. The mosques are only built for men whose uh, misogyny or his patriarchy is the only uh, driver of their egos and that's the only way, place where it has made them inclusive. So the religion is very inclusive gang in Afghanistan uh, whereas in the prophet's uh, era it was an inclusive communal learning center for the communities. Well you are a great example of what we can aspire to so I look forward to a very different Afghanistan. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, listen as Guri Mapuri, a Singaporean social entrepreneur, discusses the challenges Christian faces as he tries to change how Rwandans and other Africans think about and deal with death. Hi. It's Dr. Hi, Guri. Good to meet you. This is Gauri Mirpuri from a hotel room in Singapore. Dr. Christian, where are you in the world? Uh, I'm now actually in, uh, in Boston uh, for just a couple of weeks, but uh, I'm normally based in Rwanda, Kigali. Of course, yes. Okay, first a quick introduction. Dr. Christian Nizimira graduated from Harvard Medical School and is today a physician and palliative care activist in Kigali in Rwanda. And it's for his leadership in creating a unique Ubuntu-based approach to death and dying that we are presenting this award today. 
So Dr. Christian, I want to start right at the start. What were some of these, the pivotal points in your life that jolted you to change your mind and set you on a different path? Thank you, Guri. Uh, I would like first to join uh, my uh, colleague, Dr. Winners, to thank the Talberg Foundation and the jury uh, for this opportunity, and especially uh, talking about palliative care and uh, end of life care, so which is sometimes considered by most of people the fifth wheel of the courage in a public health system, which is not. And uh, one of the two two main points uh, made me to be uh, for, uh, to change and uh, and focus on palliative care. One was the um, uh, the consequence of the genocide uh, against the Tutsi, the Tutsi in 1994. Uh, when I just realized that uh, I can contribute to be a physician, but not only a general practitioner, but to be a surgeon. And then uh, I went to medical school, and after medical school, I went to district hospital. And uh, when I was working in district hospital, I met a, a patient, 24 years old, who was really dying with uh, liver cancer. Uh, and the sad story is um, his mom came to me and kneeled before me and asked if I can give something to him, then he can sleep and wake up no more. In that time, I failed that I failed twice. One as a physician, because I was feared to prescribe morphine beyond, there is so myth beyond uh, using morphine, opioid. And second, as a Rwandan, because in our culture, when an elder person kneel before a young person, culturally, you are failed. So, and then from that point, I changed from my dream to be a surgeon, to a new passion, to be a palliative care physician. Interesting. So the genocide, how old were you at the time? I was 16, 16 years old. That's got to have a huge impact on you. Um, mm. The... Talk to us about the myth of morphine. You know, your work has led to a five-fold increase in its prescription uh, in your country. What is the myth and why did you challenge it? One of the biggest myths uh, surrounding morphine is uh, morphine has some death. So uh, people fear uh, in most of African countries, people and my colleague physician as well, they fear to prescribe morphine. People think that if you prescribe morphine, uh, the next day or the next couple of minutes, the patient will die. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that increase the suffering of the patient, but not only for the patient, but also for the family members in the environment also of the patient. And uh, it's, it was really imperative as uh, when I, I shifted to be a palliative care physician and I've been trained in palliative care, then I just realized that uh, we need to use morphine more and more for people who have severe pain, of course. And uh, it's, it's release uh, the physical pain, but also it decrease anxiety and, uh, and depression for the patient and the family members. So we tried through education and advocacy to making sure that people will not, uh, you know, uh, still continue to fear about morphine, but they need to use it. Yeah. Sure. So you were trained in the West, but you came back to Africa and realized very quickly that the situation, the culture is entirely different. Just talk about that. How has it affected your approach? How did you change? Uh, what I, I realized that uh, context, context matters. So you cannot apply uh, something in one side of the world and put it in another side of the world. So education doesn't necessarily mean duplication, but rather than adaptation. And before to adapt, you need to adopt in the world has already existed. So then I realized that the matrix of care uh, in palliative care is completely different from West uh, to, to, to Rwanda. Let's, I can take one of those examples. I, I, I realize in, uh, in Rwandan context, uh, we have a saying, when you are well, you belong to yourself, but when you are sick, you belong to your family. So it's not about uh, the patient's autonomy will remove the community responsibility. It's both. So you will have, it's why we're using a butterfly approach which is in one wing, you have the patient autonomy about choice, expectation uh, um, from the patient. 
And in other end, you have the community responsibility because the patient is not an isolated component out of this community. The patient is part of the community and the community is part of the society. So it was really, really important to understand that and to work on that uh, platform uh, for something already existed. And now we can adapt to the, co the context or the normal challenges. So it was interesting. I was listening to one of your interviews and you said uh, patient is in hospital and his immediate family or the family that turns up to support him can be anything between 30 people and 50 people. So what, at a practical level, give us an example of how you would approach this in a hospital ward. How would you bring this um, sort of community that he's surrounded by into the process? Yeah, one of the, um, uh, let's say one of the solution, uh, because as the patient is part of the community, you need also to bring the community as a support. So family members are not necessarily barriers or challenges to the support of the patient. Uh, and the, one of uh, the uh, experiences what you do after admitting the patient is to bring and call, of course, the family members meeting. So as you said, you can expect uh, how many people expect to come to the family meeting. In Africa context, uh, it will be around 20, 30 people. And I remember the last meeting I heard um, in, in Kigali uh, the last month, it will, almost about 40 people came uh, during the meeting. So then you can feel that it will be a challenging to convince 40 people uh, on the management of the patients, but this is one side of the, the, of the perception. But uh, in other side, it said, instead of how to use them, how to make a very good communication, how to bring them, to understand one, they need to understand about the disease, they need to understand about the management and they need to understand about the care. So then I came to realize to set up a concept which was coming from um, some of uh, um, existing language and, uh, and, and the traditional way of, uh, of sharing stories in, in Rwanda and uh, using animals, archetypes to describe the suffering of family members. So then from each family members, you have a different language and you have different solutions. And that was really important. And also one of the most important thing is to identify who is the lion. In every group, there is always a lion. There is always a leader. And the working with that leader to bring the family uh, on, on, the, let's, on the responsibility to support the patient. And the, the good thing is in terms of advocacy, it's really good because you talk with the 40 people in the morning and the rest of the village know what about palliative care, which is really good. I'll jump to my last question since death is not a taboo word in your world, but let's talk about your obituary. What three sentences do you want written about you when you die? Brazil. Okay, uh, good question. It's not common to ask uh, <laughs> coffee. <laughs> So three words, um, resilience, hope, mm -hmm. and no regret. Resilience, hope, and no regrets. Yeah. And uh, are these the three things that keep you going as a leader in, in the work that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, as my uh, part of the, uh, my colleague said, uh, you know, uh, leadership is more about character than a position. And the challenges, challenges are and inspiration to bring change in our leadership. So, and I think uh, what makes me wake up every in the morning is in our, my, I have a different leadership. My leadership is not about to have followers, but I'm a following because the leaders are patients. And the, what I'm doing is just to put a soul in our leadership and that will make a difference to impact people. I love that, that you don't have followers, but that you follow the patient. Thank I'm you still, so much. I'm still following the patients because they are the leaders. Yeah. I'm the follower. I wish you, wish you every good luck in your, in your work. And it was uh, such a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Christian. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcast and subscribe. 
Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. Mm-hmm.